Hey guys, Jeremy here with Simple Little Life. Today in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a knife. Now, this is the template of the knife we're gonna build. This is called the EDC Companion. We're gonna do this kind of together here. I'll be beside you the whole way. I'll explain every step as I'm doing it, so hopefully you can kind of learn something. The steel we're gonna use to make the knife today is CPM 154. It'll be 1 8 of an inch thick, and I think the stock that I'm gonna cut it out of is one and a half inch thick bar stock or wide bar stock. One quick thing to note about CPM 154 is it is one of these stainless steels that has a tendency to work harden. Meaning that if I try cutting it out with my portable bandsaw, usually I find I get an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch into it and then kaboom, that steel hardens, cuts the teeth off the saw blade and you're done. But do remember there are some stainless steels that cut out just fine. Uh, Nitro V, ABL, those are two steels that I have no issues cutting with my portable bandsaw. Uh, we need to mark out the template onto the steel and I'm gonna use some spray out dye, some layout dye. This is a knife I make quite a few of, so I have myself a little template, just mild steel. Put it in this little jig here. This is a toggle clamp. Lock it down. I'm gonna use a transfer punch. These are handy tools. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. Uh, they have all the different sizes that match very common sizes of drill bits and transferring holes. Use a transfer punch. Makes sense. So I find the one that fits and smack it. Well, that's cool beans. Looks great to me. And I'm actually gonna do two of these because why not? Okay, let's head outside and cut those out. All right guys, we got these things rough cut out with the angle grinder and now we're gonna jump on the belt grinder. What I like to do is use a, a fairly worn out 36 or 60 grit ceramic belt uh, just to kind of bring these lines in right to uh, the lines that we described out, kind of get this profiling done. We'll work on the flat platen on my one grinder, then we'll jump onto the small contact wheel when we're done that and kind of clean this part up. Most of the work, I would say 95 or 96% of the work, maybe 96.5 is done on the flat platen for this knife anyways. cleaned up on the grinder, nice profile on both of these blades. Well, what I'm gonna do now is drill the holes for the pins and on this one, the one that the customer had ordered, he's going to get uh, white fiberglass pins. It's gonna have black G10 handles. And so we'll drill those holes. We've got those laid out already from our template. Uh, if I didn't have a template, what I would typically do is kind of draw on here. You can see I kind of put a line roughly where I want my handle to come to and try to evenly space those. We're gonna have three pins in here and then I'm also gonna drill a couple of extra holes that'll be about one eighth of an inch in diameter uh, that we can have a little passage so that the epoxy can run through the handle to both sides of the scales, just to kind of give it a better bond. Also lighten it up a little bit, you can remove extra material. Uh, the main reason though is the advantage you get when you can have that little passageway so the epoxy goes from one side of the handle scale to the other. And one thing I actually just realized I forgot to do is um, take this to the belt grinder. You see we've got our directional lines here this way. All these lines are running this way from where we had like profiled it on the grinder. What I want to do is actually take it to the grinder and with the belt running this way, I'm going to come like this just to kind of clean everything up, smooth everything out. I like to do that before heat treat. It's not a big deal, but I just kind of like the look of it better. So I'm going to do that real quick. We are going to be hitting all these edges post heat treat as well. Obviously when we shape the handle scales, so this will be cleaning it all up to a much higher grit, but I just don't like working with the lines this way. I like to have everything going like this. 
personal preference thing, I think. All right, now we've got these two ready to go. We're gonna make some stainless steel envelopes for it. The steel that I use, the stainless steel wrap, it's a 309 tool wrap. The reason we're gonna do that is because the temperatures that we're going up to are very high, 1950 Fahrenheit, actually my kiln's about there. And um, at those temperatures, if we were to just put this into the kiln, there's a lot of oxygen in the kiln, it would actually start burning the carbon out of the steel, decarburizing. So what we'll do is we'll make a small envelope, we'll fold the corners over, and we hammer it all nice and tight so it's airtight. So ultimately, as it's in there and it starts to heat up, it'll burn what little oxygen is in that envelope and there'll be no more to burn after that. I also put a little bit of baby powder on the blades. I find that protects them from possibly welding themselves to the foil when I do the plate quench. Uh, CPM 154 is not too bad for it, but steels like Nitro V have actually had like really solid welds where the envelope welded itself to the, to the blade steel. There's my kiln. And obviously that's not something we want. So we'll make our little pouches, we'll put these in there, and then we're gonna put both of these in, and then we're gonna do a plate quench once they're in there for about 20 minutes soaking. And I usually put them in, like I've got my kiln at 1950 now. When I put these in there, the temperature's gonna drop. First, we're gonna lose some heat from the kiln. Second of all, these are cool, so they're gonna cool the kiln down. Probably goes to about 1800 degrees, 1700 degrees, and it'll take a while to come back up again. We'll let them soak for about 15 minutes at 1950, and then we'll throw them in a the plate quench. Nitro's knife is in the bottom there. And one more crimp. And the pliers that I'm using, those are just called sheet metal mechanic pliers. You can pick them up at big box stores and stuff like that. Just like that, we are ready for the kiln. Kind of center it nicely in there. And we have a foil pouch. You may have seen people put paper inside their pouches, and that's true, some people do that. My experience though is that it causes the pouches just to bubble up right away, they get real puffy, and I don't get any better results. So I don't put anything in there. Having said that, some people put something combustible in there like a piece of paper, or a little stick, or some wood, or something like that. I just personally don't like to do it. First one goes in. Ha. And we'll put the second one in. All right, we'll just bake those cookies off. Once they're done their soak, we're gonna take them out one at a time. I'm gonna give them a plate quench. So we're gonna stick them in between these aluminum plates. These are one inch thick aluminum plates. I've got them in a woodworker's bench vise. We'll put them in here, clamp it down real tight, and then we're gonna go blow compressed air in there. And that'll bring this thing, it'll cool down in about less than a minute. And this is a good way to quench uh, stainless steels when you've got them wrapped in foil. So once that happens, I'm gonna be hustling so I won't have time to talk. So I figure I'd just explain it right now. But that step is coming, right? Right now. Nice thing to see with the stainless steel is that you don't have spots like that. That's where some mild decarburization has occurred. Uh, obviously it doesn't really matter in there because we don't care about carbon content of the handle, but the whole blade portion, it looks really good and it should be really nice and hard. Yes. That file is not biting into there at all. So the next step is actually gonna be liquid nitrogen. I get asked a lot about the liquid nitrogen and why do you put them in the blades. The big reason is that for stainless steels, they really benefit with a cryogenic treatment. Liquid nitrogen being considered a deep cryo and something like uh, dry ice with acetone that would be considered like a shallow cryo. It's also cryo treatment, uh, but it just really helps maximize the performance of these stainless steels without getting super duper technical. It's just better for them. Now typically high carbon steels like 10 series steels, 01 tool steel, stuff like that, they don't need, they don't require cryogenic treatment. 
However, they do also benefit from it in that it significantly increases wear resistance. Uh, I found some studies online that showed that O1 tool steel with a cryogenic treatment with liquid nitrogen can actually increase its wear resistance by up to 400%. 400% is quite an increase, and for that reason, I pretty much do a cryogenic treatment on all the knives that I make, especially if I've got the doer filled with liquid nitrogen. So what I'm gonna do is I gotta take these two blades, plus I'm waiting for one more larger knife that's gonna come out of the heat treat. Once those are done, we're gonna dip them in the liquid nitrogen and leave them in there overnight. Now when I pull it out of liquid nitrogen tomorrow morning and I thaw this thing out, I'm actually gonna put a time lapse on it for you and it's really cool to see all these little structures form as this thing starts to thaw up and you see all the ice build up on it and you watch it melt away. You know, when it's in the shop, you kind of see it hanging there and it's like, oh cool, it's frosty now, but when you watch it and fast forward, it's kind of interesting. I got the kiln just fired up here. So we are ready to go. One thing, little tip that I always do, is I always make sure it comes up to my tempering temperature before I put the knives in, because one time I had the mistake that I thought I was on the tempering program, but I was actually on the heat treat program. So I put the knife in there and voila, I basically ruined all the work I had done on the heat treat. So I take this off, put these in. And by the end of the day, we'll be ready to start grinding them. There. So again, that'll be two temper cycles, 400 degrees. Uh, I actually water dunk in between now. I don't exactly know why. I've heard people say you actually get a benefit from water dunking uh, right out of your first temper cycle. Out of the second temper cycle, I just let it air cool. Uh, but as soon as these are done, we get that done. Uh, I'll be back at you. We'll get ready to grind this sucker. And before I do my grinding, I wanna give myself a line to grind to. Actually, two lines to grind to. Uh, what I like to do is have two lines that are about 10 to 15 thousandths of an inch apart. The reason for that is if I were to have one line dead center, and if I had some issues with the top grind lined up here, sometimes you can't really address those without affecting where your edge is. You wanna make sure your edge is centered on the blade. So if I grind to about 10 thousandths of an inch, I'll take it off the jig, I'll kind of evaluate what my top grind line is doing, and I can finesse it by hand a little bit there. You know, I've got a little bit more room to play if I wanna, you know, kind of grow this plunge line this way a little bit. I can do it by hand and I can kind of keep the pressure off of the edge area. And I just think that's a, a better way for me personally. Another way to do it is you take the material thickness that you have and a drill bit that's the same size, put it down on the flattest, hardest surface you can find, like a granite surface plate, even a really good hard piece of wood could work. And you basically just kind of scratch the tip along. And generally that will give you two lines. You scratch one side, flip it over, scratch the other side, and make sure you hold the, the bit from twisting and rotating. That will usually give you two lines that are about 10 thousandths of an inch apart, just kind of the way that drill bits are designed. That works really well too. So we'll head over and I'll show you exactly the tool that I use for doing this, and then we'll get to grinding. All right, so what I'll do, I'll take a big old Sharpie and I just kind of mark out on there. And then this is the jig and this is adjustable. I can move this scribe up and down and essentially I'll just set this flat on here, hold it like this. Mark out my line, flip it over. Mark out the other line. So now you can see I've actually got two lines there and they're about, I would say like 10 to 15 thousandths of an inch apart. A lot of folks ask, how do I know how to set this up? Uh, generally, I just do trial and error on the back here. We're gonna be grinding this away anyways when we bring our handle scales to the tank. So usually I'll throw a little Sharpie on there and then I'll do my tests. And if I have to move it in and out a little bit, then I can do that, but it's a pretty good little system. And now we are ready to grind. Now, since this is a slightly smaller knife, we're gonna be starting out with a 60 grit belt. Sometimes I'll go like to a 36, but for something small like this, this should be just fine. We will set our jig like that. Get our little screw ready. Always like to make sure I'm pressing down on my jig and the blade as I tighten it up. That way we have a repeatable Place to get to, and we grind.
All right, so one thing I noticed, uh, the jig that I previously was using wasn't giving me the right grind. Uh, we were pretty much to that line there, we were about halfway through the cutting edge, again with that 10 to 15 thou clearance, and I'm not getting enough grind on this side of the blade. I like the bevel to come up a little higher, so I'm going to switch up to this jig. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why the other one was giving me issues, but this one here is just an angle iron with a bolt, and then for reference, Got this little pin right here, and then I just slip this right into there, to one of those holes, locating holes, and we'll clamp it on, and we'll go in at it like this, and that way we can get a little bit higher bevel. I don't like to have a full flat grind on here, but I like the bevel to come up at least to halfway, so quick adjustment on the fly. Got to be flexible sometimes. There, that's a little bit more what I was looking for. So one thing I find really helps with grinding is to keep it very consistent the whole way along. You'll notice I'm always starting here and working towards the tip. I've seen some people, if they get some weird stuff going on, they'll try and concentrate on one area. I like to take slower passes and kind of do start, finish, and as I'm growing the bevel, I want to focus on keeping it consistent, fairly nice and even. Obviously, it's good practice for when you're getting to the finishing stages, but then it also just kind of builds that habit and, and that muscle memory in working in a consistent manner. All right, even with that angle iron jig, I found it wasn't working that great, so I made a whole brand new jig with the proper angle. Um, what I want to do now is I've taken these bevels up to 120 grit on ceramic and it's not a bad finish. Pretty clean, but uh, I'm just going to use these Trizac belts and get in there and just put a much nicer satin on there. I'll show you the difference between the two. This does very light cutting. I'm really not doing much stock removal. I'm just kind of refining the grain of the grind. The grind grain. Here we have the 120, here we have the Trizact. So we still have grain structure in there, but it is much more refined. I like that. And then after we're done with this, I'm actually gonna take a little bit of uh, the Scotch-Brite belt, and I actually I'll squirt it with some WD-40, and then do a final kind of go over, and that way we'll still keep the grain. I love the grind lines in a blade, uh, but this will just really polish it up, make it real silky smooth. And uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could go from here. You could take this to uh, continue up the Trizact and then go to a cork belt if you want to get a, almost a mirror finish. Personally, I'm not a fan of the mirror finish, but I really like this. Just a nice satiny uh, grind line finish. Okay, so here's a quick <clears throat> look at, uh, this is the scotch Bright with a WD-40. See, it kind of just softens it, kind of makes it a little bit creamy. And this is just the Trizac, so it's a lot shinier, a lot crispier, but this is creamier. I like this one. All right, one thing I almost forgot, <clears throat> we were gonna put a Spanish notch in here, and what a Spanish notch is, it's just a little tiny grind out. We're using a quarter inch small contact wheel, little tiny notch right there that gives a stop to the actual cutting edge. I find that can be really beneficial when you're sharpening uh, because this little transition part here, you know, this plunge line we call it, uh, that can be an awkward spot to sharpen because you're going from thin to thick metal. So a little tiny notch there really helps the sharpening process and I personally like the look of them. There we go, Spanish notch. And again, the blade stops right there, really nice and even, really handy for sharpening and uh, 
Yeah, it's got the bevels all shiny, creamy. And uh, next thing we're gonna do is cut out our scale material. For this, I'm using G10. Uh, G10, if you're new to knife making, it's kind of almost like a, it's like a fiberglass resin composite or something, I, I don't know. Um, it's pretty intense stuff though. Warning that if you try cutting this on a wooden bandsaw, you will very quickly dull your blades. I just realized that. I've always been using my metal cutting bandsaw and I've recently picked up a nice little wood bandsaw and I thought, oh, this will be great. I saw sparks. I actually saw sparks coming as I was cutting these up. So, uh, two of these knives I'm making at the moment. One is going to get red G10 with brass pins, and the other is going to get black G10 with white fiberglass pins. These are the fiberglass pins. I get these from Maker Material Supply, an eBay store. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever, but I get asked a lot, where do you get the pins from? So, Maker Material Supply. I have found their service to be fantastic. Again, I'm not affiliated or sponsored with them in any way, shape, or form but uh, good customer service, good company. I'm willing to say, hey, go there, get some stuff. Mind you, I'm gonna make sure I place an order before this video comes out because often I'll recommend something and I'll go order it like a week later and they'll be sold out. So I'm not gonna shoot myself in the foot. Let me get my order in and then I'll tell you all about it. And this is obviously a very boring process. Um, I kind of just lay it out like this, lay it out like this, take a square, and then we'll clamp it together. We're gonna use the cant twist clamps, can't twist clamps. These things are fantastic. And then we'll put both layers of the G10 on top, or the bottom, I guess, clamp this. And then we're gonna use these holes, one, two, three, as the guides to drill through. And we'll be drilling both sets of handle scales, like both sides, at the same time. Really accurate, really fast. I find if you get a decent set of can't twist clamps on there, lock her down super tight, boom, 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 nothing moves, super accurate. All right, we got it drilled out. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna trace the outline around here. And I wanna figure out roughly where I want this to come. Something like that. The thing I always think about here is keeping these scales in the matching orientation. So like that. So what I would do is I'll put on this one, RI, which is right inside. And this is left inside. Or to hold the knife like this, left, right, inside, inside. That way I can line them up. What I'm gonna do now, cut this arch in right here and see if I like it in relationship to where the plunge line is and the grind line. And if I like it, then I'll put these together, put a pins in there and then match them up. Yeah. I just finished. So here we're just kind of grinding in that transition. And then I put the two together, hold them with a pin, cut these suckers out. Now there is a part of the process that I completely forgot to film. And that is after I get everything profiled, I want to make sure I take care of the end of the handle, this section right here. Uh, what I did is I set the work rest on my grinder to 45 degrees and grind that in. And then I also take that and bring it up to 800 grit, hit it on the buffer, and get that completely finished before glue up. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna put our stencil on. So what I like to do is I use a little vinyl cutter and I cut out my logo, and this is clear vinyl. The nice thing with the clear vinyl is it allows you to really accurately locate it on the blade. And then I like to do this ahead of time so that I can get these, the relationship, you know, with the logo, the blade, everything kind of lined up in advance so that I'm not, you know, guessing or, you know, trying to get in real nice and tight here with the brush after the handle's glued on. Also, in case I have any issues with uh, accidentally etching or marking some other part of the blade, obviously I'd rather find that out now so I can do the cleanup, any that would be required. So this is the way I like to do it. I like that, that looks real good. And then I'm using a, an Electro Etcher, specifically the Personalizer Plus. Basically, it's a DC, AC-DC Etcher. Uh, the negative lead is the carbon brush, and then the positive is the clamp. Tape off all the extra areas. It's 
So there we have it. Nice deep etch there. That's really deep, actually. I like it. And uh, we got the mark on there, so we are ready to mix up some epoxy and glue on these scales. And then for the glue up, I use a two-part epoxy. I use Devcon. There's lots of good brands out there. Uh, made sure I cleaned everything really well with lacquer thinner first. And then obviously you want to do a dry fit up. Uh, I forgot to film that, but I always dry fit up all my scales, the pins. You don't want to be wrestling with that stuff with the epoxy on the cure. And again, the five minute epoxy. So I have a very quick working time, but generally I will let this cure up overnight. And then the last step, take the tape off and then take all that squeeze out off while the epoxy is still wet. Using lacquer thinner, making sure it's super clean. This step is critical. All right, folks, welcome back. We have got these knives dry overnight. And I think they came out pretty darn good. Uh, what we're gonna do today, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these pins off with the saw, the portable band saw, and then we're gonna grind everything flat and true. Now, one of the reasons I wanna cut these, uh, a couple things here. Uh, so these fiberglass, pins if you ever want to use these you need to be careful because they get really hot really quickly and they kind of melt and they turn black so when you're doing your finish sanding on these you don't want to be using a high speed on your belt grinder you want to kind of go nice and easy other words you're gonna get some really gross looking stuff and you're gonna to have to go in deeper and deeper than maybe you'd wanted to. So by cutting the outsides flush, I can avoid heating this stuff to start with. And then I'll just be doing little touches on the belt grinder to bring this flush. Second thing, brass pins. They pose a similar issue. Brass heats up really, really quickly. So again, by cutting these off as close to flush as I can, being very careful when I um, touch these to the belt grinder, I'm not worried about discoloring the brass, but so much discoloring possibly the G10 around the brass if it gets too hot and the epoxy and then also losing the epoxy. If you heat up epoxy too hot, it loses its effectiveness, it changes its characteristics. You don't want to do that. So this part of the job when we're kind of trimming everything up, uh, we want to be careful. We want to take our time and uh, we want to think about heat a lot when we're doing this stuff. One advantage to having stainless steel blades and synthetic scales, if things are getting hot, we can actually dip this entire thing in the water. Obviously, kind of want to make sure we're not going to put scratches on our finished blades. And uh, speaking of that, I'm going to give one little wipe down. That's probably not showing up very well, but there's a little tiny residue from wiping it down earlier. I want to get that cleaned up, and then I'm going to wrap these blades in uh, painter's tape. I don't think I'm going to need to dunk these in water as I'm grinding them. I'm just going to alternate between one and the other. It's kind of the advantage of making two knives at once, so you can kind of control your heat when you're doing up your finishing stages. So. Let's get these taped up and we'll get on to finishing up the handles. All right, so thinking about laying out uh, different grind lines, I take a very, very simple approach to it in that when I'm working on a knife, there's certain planes that I like to keep as flat as possible until the very end. So the sides of the scales, I mean, in theory right now, these should be very, very accurately parallel with each other. And I try to concentrate on keeping them that way so that times like this, say if I wanna lay out some lines and I've already laid these out, you can see those pencil marks there. If I've been working hard at keeping these flat and not removing extra material up until this point, I can use that as a reference point and I can simply set it down. Usually I use my granite surface plate, but even a really flat piece of wood and something as simple as taking a pencil, right? Lay it down here and uh, keep it flat on the table and you've got some very accurate lines laid out. Now, what if that line doesn't end up where you want? Well, think very simply, a ruler, I could shim it up. This would put the line a little bit closer to the outside of the handle, or I could shim my pencil, stick my pencil up there and do that and then just move the knife around it. So when you think about, you know, through the processes until you're ready to shape and sculpt the handle, I like to keep these handles as flat as possible, even throw the profiling and stuff like that. That way we can give ourselves lines to mark to, even for a little line right in here, I had room. I could just come in here and it sneaks almost all the way uh, underneath there so that I have a nice line a nice pencil mark that I can use when I'm grinding in that little thumb relief So just a really really basic super simple way to keep things consistent and you know, there's a certain part of knife making where 
I like it to be very technical. I mean, I want good edge geometry. I want good handles. I want people to be able to measure the handles. But then there's the other part of it that, you know, free flow, like sculpting by hand. And I love that part of it too. And I think that's what kind of makes it look smooth. I, I think you can do a better job just finessing it kind of artistically than you can like very technically laying things out. But I find if I get these very basic layouts done, that really helps me bring everything to those lines with consistency. And then from there, I can feather it and fine tune it. And you know, it's not absolutely flawless, but we've got a really good sharp line to go to. And as we kind of finesse it and, and work it by hand, uh, it keeps that nice organic natural feel to it while looking very uh, symmetrical, even, consistent. And I find that has made a huge difference in the overall build quality of my knives. So now that we've got these lines marked out, we're gonna go with the slack belt platen, the rotary platen, and uh, we're gonna grind in this roughly 45, then we're gonna put on the small contact wheel, bring this at a roughly 45, bring that in, and then we're gonna use the J-Flex scalloped belts, which are these guys right here. And you see these scallops? What that allows you to do is it allows the belt to flex into corners without biting. And then the J cloth, it has to do with the density, the heaviness of the cloth. So this is a very, very flexible backer that this abrasive's on. Uh, these here are 220, and to tell you the truth, I'll use these for three months for one of them. Like, I mean, I don't swap these out very much, but then again, when I'm at this point with a 220, I'm just kind of blending everything together. I'll do my main hogging off with an 80 grit aluminum oxide belt and you know, get all that done. But then this is just mostly kind of just to blend it, refine those scratches a bit. And then from there, we will go ahead and we'll do, uh, you know, some really fine hand polishing. And when I run these belts, typically, <coughs> excuse me. When I run these belts, typically I will run them between two, uh, the wheels without the platen in there. So, you know, I got a distance about this much and they still have some flex and I can get in there and kind of make it curve around these inner portions and stuff like that. These things work really well. So, Let's get it done. And another step of the process that I forgot to get a decent camera angle. Uh, what I'm doing here is I've got a five inch contact wheel and I'm putting in a little thumb relief. So you can kind of see how I'm holding the knife to the contact wheel and I'm coming in at a slight angle. I wish I'd put my camera overhead uh, so you could get a better picture of this, but I figured I'd jump in here real quick, post-production voiceover and kind of explain it. All right guys, we've got all the profiling and the shaping of the handle done off the belt grinder. Went over it with some hand sandpaper. I went up to 800 grit. And now I'm just gonna jump on the buffing wheel. And the wheel that I like to use, it's a yellow wheel and it's actually sewn. So it's fairly rigid. It's kind of been sewn all the way, you know, at different diameters, different radiuses, it goes out. And the nice thing about that is that when I use that in combination with black rouge, I can actually remove material. Uh, so when things are kind of matte and they're dry and there's like powder all over them, everything looks nice, right? And then you polish it up and then kapow, all your mistakes, they really jump out at you and you can actually see really well what's going on. And I find often if I'm like kind of grinding here, I'm like, oh shoot, this line comes a little bit too much this way or a little too much that way. I can go in there with that buffing wheel and actually remove material with some heavy pressure. At the same time, when I just keep it light, it does a good job of just smoothing out the surface, polishing everything up. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop rather than you know just a, a softer buffing mop and some other type of rouge where it's just gonna polish. And if I find some inconsistencies, I gotta go back here, gotta start hand sanding again, or go to the machine. I can actually kind of take care of all that work on once with that buffer. So let's go ahead, we will polish this thing up and then we will go ahead and put an edge on it. We'll sharpen it up. Uh, I'm not sure what sharpening system we're gonna use yet, but there's lots of great options out there. And uh, this thing will be ready for a big reveal. And we'll see how well it cuts. All right, we are ready to take the tape off. We'll clean up that residue. Pretty happy with how these turned out. Uh, the one thing I have to do now is make sheaths for them and then sharpen them up.
The way that I'm gonna sharpen these knives is with the TS Prof K03. Now I have a link, a little playlist, I'll put that in the description box below, of knife sharpening. I've tested out quite a few different types of knife sharpeners on this system, going over some pros and some cons. So if you're interested in that stuff, that'll be in a playlist down below. Uh, what I'll do often is that this edge right here, what we had left this cutting edge to, pre-sharpening is about 20 thousandths of an inch. And that's usually what I like to leave EDC type blades. I mean, really this isn't necessarily supposed to be like a fine meat slicer or something like that. This is a knife you carry in your pocket, you're gonna use it for all types of things. And I like to make sure I've got some protection, some thickness to the edge there. So, you know, if you're not cutting ideal things, it gets a little bit of abuse, that edge is gonna hold up. So with it being a little bit thick and with a system like the TS Prof, I could end up spending a long time manually sharpening it. What I'm gonna do instead is jump onto my belt grinder. I've got 120 grit ceramic, and I'm just gonna barely rough in the initial grinds just to get rid of most of that material and then we'll refine that cutting edge from there with the TS Prof. What I like to do when I'm using any type of a clamp sharpening system is put a little bit of tape onto the blade where you're going to clamp it just to protect it and then also I kind of did a, a lousy job here but you can see the sharpie that I've kind of put on the edge there just so that it kind of lets me know if whatever angle I start at is either too sharp or not sharp enough or whatever so uh, and this TS Prof right now, I've got the single clamp in. You can also have these individuals that you could actually put farther out to sharpen up larger knives. But as easy as this is, you just put this in here. And then this one here is like a jacking screw. I'm gonna tighten that up and we're ready to go. Start with extra coarse. And first thing I like to do with this system is set up my stop sort of right here so that I don't go too far. See right there, I'm actually past where I would sharpen and this would actually scratch the bevel. So I'll loosen this off, slide it up a bit, push all the way up, make sure, yes, I'm not gonna go past the edge of the knife. And same thing here, make sure I'm not gonna come down too far at any one point. We'll adjust this one as well. And, and we'll see roughly where we are grinding on. So right now we are quite, see that was about 16 degrees, we're about, I think we'll go 20 degrees on this blade. Feeling for that burr. When people say pulling a burr, uh, what they're often referring to is that right on the very edge, if you drag your finger up, and it's a lot easier the coarser the grit you're at, but you can kind of feel it hang. It kind of, like right now when I'm sharpening this side, I'm making a burr that goes down this way, so it kind of hangs and you can kind of feel it. So. Uh, especially in the core stones, that's when you know you're at your apex and you're actually folding the metal over one side and the other side. And then essentially each step from here in between is gonna be less time because we have pulled that burr and essentially we're just refining that edge. And so that burr's kind of folded over and it's toothy with really coarse stones. I apologize for the heater, it's kind of loud, but um, as we go to a finer stone, those teeth become finer and finer and finer and the burr is actually way more difficult to feel but you can kind of see it and you can start to feel it up to about, at least for me, 600, uh, 600 grit. But that's basically what we're doing. We're just kind of folding it over. Once we're there, then we'll go to a better grit and we're kind of folding over real coarse grit and then we'll do the next one and there'll be a little finer grit and then a finer grit. And uh, obviously switching both sides. You want to do one side, then do the whole other side of the blade, then go to your next grit and do both sides of the blade. But that's kind of what we're doing here. And it's just a matter of time. Sorry, I guess I should have uh, the camera on the action. Again, here you see, I really like this Spanish notch. Gives a definite stop to where we need to sharpen to. All right, now that we've got all the abrading done. I'm gonna hit it with a leather strop. I'm not trying to get like a mirror polish, I'm just trying to really take care of the burr. It's gonna look pretty nice, like it's definitely gonna have a nice secondary bevel, but we're not getting too carried away. Again, as an EDC blade, this thing's gonna get used. Okay. Is it sharp? I believe it is.
decent test. I like to use foam book paper. Obviously foam books are getting harder to find nowadays, but newspaper works well also. You see that? So it's, 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 it looks mirrored. I know it looks mirrored on this camera, at least from what I can see from my screen. It's not what I would consider a mirror polish, just a really nicely honed edge. And uh, does it cut? That's a nice cutter. Happy enough with that. Well, there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned something. That's ultimately the goal of these videos is to teach you. Uh, the one thing I didn't show was making the sheath for this knife. And I've got this sheath right here as well. I did a vertical carry sheath for this knife here. I filmed those and those are actually gonna be in a separate video. You can check that video out right here. If you haven't subscribed, you can click this right here. Subscribe to the channel, I would greatly appreciate it. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. And as always, I thank you so much for watching. Cheers. Mm -hmm.